Well, I told you the parable of the businessman and the Mexican fisherman. I'm going to tell you the parable of the couch. This is one you probably don't know. Now, once upon a time, there was a pastor who graduated from seminary in 1986. Don't know who that was. But she moved into her first apartment, which was pretty pathetic. And her furniture was just absolutely scary because she moved in with the $15 couch that she bought when she was a teenager at a yard sale. Actually, it was off the side of the road. 15 whole dollars for the couch from the 1940s. It was pretty spiffy, if she does say so herself. She also had her aunt's old particle board coffee tables and end tables. A friend of hers came to her house once, to her apartment, and said, is it okay if I put my feet on the coffee table? And before she could say, just be careful, when he put his feet up, the coffee table split like that, because it was such a bad piece of furniture. Well, when she moved into her first appointment to a local church, she decided she needed a new couch, because the one that she had that was from the 1940s had dry rotted so much by the 1980s that it was snowing sort of this kind of ugly old foam all over the floor. Now, she thought about getting some duct tape and trying to duct tape the bottom or put a plastic sheet under it, but it was really falling apart, so she decided to get a couch, and she went to Montgomery Wards. Anyone here old enough to remember Montgomery Wards? They had a couch for $300. Even in 1987 or 86, whatever it was, she can't remember now. That was pretty cheap for a couch. But that was a lot of money. And she prayed about it, thinking, you know, I could probably go to another yard sale and find a couch, or maybe to Goodwill. But I deserve this couch, don't I? And then she thought, no, I could give the money to the poor. I could buy food for people. But she broke down after much prayer and bought the couch. Fast forward 12 years. She's serving a bigger church with a bigger salary. And while that $300 couch still had a lot of wear in it, she decided it didn't look very good anymore. Went out and bought a $1,200 couch without even thinking about it. Didn't pray, didn't feel guilty, nothing. Bought the couch, took it home, married a really big man, six foot, four and a half inches tall, 260 pounds. He sat on it, leaned against the arm, and the arm fell right off. Guess who that pastor was? I'm telling you that story to tell you that when I preach about stewardship and talk about money, which I don't like to do, and I don't do very often, I am not preaching to you or at you. I am preaching to us, and I am out there with you in this. Because it is hard to talk about money, isn't it? Now, if I were to ask you all to turn in your W-2s, would you feel comfortable with that? Or if I asked you all to stand up and say how much you're going to give to the church, would you feel comfortable with that? I'll go ahead and say, no, we would not. We'd be on the phone to the bishop really fast if you did that, wouldn't we? But Jesus had no problem talking about money. He talked about money a lot. And in this passage, he's talking about money as the treasure that we store up for ourselves here on earth. And he also talks about the reason that we're afraid to trust God. And that is worry, right? How many of you are worriers? That is my greatest theological failing. I am a worrier. I worry about things I cannot control. I've gotten better at it through the years, but I still worry about things I can't control. But we tend to worry about money, don't we? We tend to worry that we won't have enough. And if we don't have enough, what's going to happen to us? And we think about all those worst-case scenarios about what might go on. So Jesus is dealing with our worry. Now, there was a great time in the life of the church when baby boomers got to hear their own music sort of redone like Gilligan's Island, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see, was blind, but now I see. My favorite rendition of that is, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Don't worry. Be happy. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. How precious did that grace appear. Join in, don't worry. Be happy. But it's hard not to worry, isn't it? It is hard not to worry. But worry is what robs us of joy, and Jesus is saying, enough is enough. Have you heard the expression, don't borrow trouble? Don't borrow trouble. Today's troubles are enough for today. Let tomorrow take care of tomorrow. But we get so worried, we get so obsessed, we get so scared that we tend to 
with money and other things, forget God's providence. Last week we talked about the abundance of God's grace. Remember that Italian word, abondanza? The abundance of God's grace. We sang about it this morning. I'm telling you what, glorious things that thee are spoken is the opening hymn at my funeral that I have written already. Because look at what it says. See the streams of living water springing from eternal love. Well supply thy sons and daughters and all fear of want remove. Who can faint while such a river ever will their thirst assuage? Grace which like the Lord the giver never fails from age to age. Thus deriving from our banner, light by night and shade by day, safe we feed upon the manna which God gives us when we pray. God will provide. God will provide. Maybe not as much as we'd like though, right? Or as much that it will keep us feeling safe. The only way to combat the fear and the worry of not having enough is to learn to be generous. Doesn't sound right, does it? When my husband was diagnosed with his illness, they did not consider it something that you could get disability insurance for. So he was turned down for four years for disability, even though he had paid into Social Security his entire working career. But the amazing thing that happened when he was finally approved for disability, and we had already accrued great debt, he insisted on tithing his disability check. Because he said, God has been faithful to me all my life. I will not stop being faithful to God right now. That shamed me, because I was thinking, we can't afford that, honey. But that was a lesson to me. And so I'm a tither. But I don't want you to think I'm bragging on tithing. And I do tithe. I want you to know I tithe my gross salary and my gross housing allowance to Epworth. I give beyond that to other places, but I do that because that is the basic biblical standard of giving, the first 10%. And I tell you what, once you start doing that, you don't miss it anymore because it's just there. Now, there are times, because I don't do Vanco because I, I want that 2% to go to the church and not to Vanco. There are months, Jerry can tell you, right, Jerry, that I forget, and I say to her, how long are you going to owe right now? I'll write a check for it. And the more time that goes by, the bigger the check gets. And then sometimes my hand shakes a little bit as I'm writing it. But I will continue to do that because that is the biblical standard of giving. But that's not to brag because I'm doing the bottom rung, the bottom tier. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, the reluctant founder of Methodism, the Anglican priest who decided he was going to reform the church, reform himself right out the door, the one who was called a Methodist because he was so methodical, people would line up and spit on John and Charles as they went into the chapel at Oxford to conduct Holy Communion because they called them papists. He gave 10% of his income when he had very little to live on, even if it meant he didn't eat for a couple days a week. By the time he retired from ministry, he was a very wealthy man because he was a writer and he wrote medical textbooks. He was a teacher. He was a speaker. He then gave away 90% of his income and lived on the 10%. So trust me, I'm not going to shame anybody about their giving. Now I ask you if you all would turn in your W-2s and you look at me like, are you out of your mind, lady? The largest church in Hedgesville, West Virginia, is the Independent Bible Church. Over 800 people worship there a week. But they only have about 200 members because in order to be a member, you have to give them your W-2 and they will tell you what you are able to give. And if you don't give it, you're out. I'm not talking about that kind of stewardship. But I'm saying that our generosity is an indication of our trust. It's hard to say that, isn't it? Because it's hard to let go of trying to control everything. It is so hard to give up control over our finances. It's hard to give up control over all aspects of our life. But if we're going to say Jesus is Lord, we have to say Jesus is Lord of everything I am and everything I have. That's when it gets hard because Jesus is going to tell you who to love. Jesus, more than telling you who to love, is going to tell you who you can't hate anymore, who you have to give up old resentments to. And Jesus is going to be the Lord of your wallet and your checking account and your bank statement. Elizabeth Lamaster, I tell this story about her all the time. She's probably tired of hearing it because sometimes she'll listen and say, stop it. She got her call to ministry during one of my sermons. I was so impressed by that. I thought, oh, I had a hand in that. But I was quoting actually Bishop Yapel, who ordained me. He used to say all the time, don't tell me what you believe. Show me your checkbook. Back in the day when people had checkbooks and put the stuff in there. Show me your credit card statement and I'll tell you what you believe in. Elizabeth looked at her credit card statement in her checkbook and said, I believe in shoe shopping. And that changed her life at that moment. She decided she needed to trust God more and 
shop for shoes less. She still loves shoes. She did our audit for us, and instead of paying her, we gave her a $100 gift card to DSW, which she was very thrilled to receive. But it's not about money. I keep saying stewardship isn't about money. But stewardship has everything to do with trust. Do you trust God with your life? And we have so many examples, don't we? Including King David, who wrote those words. And we used a modern interpretation of it this morning. But the Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. Say that with me. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me into green pastures. If we can remember what God has done for us, we can learn to trust God more and more and put worry to the side. It's hard, isn't it? Now, one of my favorite theologians is Walter Brueggemann, who is still alive at 88 years old, and he was the professor of Old Testament at Columbia University School of Divinity in Decatur, Georgia. He wrote a book or actually it was a, a lesson called The Liturgy of Abundance and the Myth of Scarcity. And this is what he says. People who, think they can, people who think their lives consist of struggling to get more and more can never slow down because they won't ever have enough. That's the investment banker in the story. Because probably if we took that story to its end, by the time he was able to retire and go and fish and drink wine and play guitar with his friends and have a siesta with his wife and sleep late. He may have dropped dead from all the years of work that he had to do before he got to that moment. And lest you think I'm talking about a political party or system up here, I'm not. Jesus was not a socialist. Jesus was not a Republican. Jesus was not a capitalist. Jesus was none of those things. But he did abide by the Mosaic Covenant, which said, take as much as you need, and no more so that others may have what they need. Which is why we go back to that story about the Jews in the desert wandering for 40 years. They complained, didn't they? Because they were worried they wouldn't have enough. But God gave them manna every day. And God said, take only what you need for today, except the night before the Sabbath, take enough for two days. What happened when they tried to store it up for themselves? Maggots. Ew. That's why Jesus is saying to them, don't store up your treasures here on earth where moth and rust break in and decay and thieves break in to steal. Put your treasure in heaven because where your treasure is, that is where your heart is. So we have to ask ourselves, is our treasure in Jesus Christ? Are we going to trust him? Or are we going to trust our bank books? Are we going to trust Jesus or are we going to shop for shoes? Are we going to learn to be happy with what we have or are we going to seek more until we cannot at all fulfill our needs and our fears and our desires? It's hard. I don't like talking about money, but I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just talking about money for here. I love always quoting Millard Fuller, the man who started Habitat for Humanity, who always started his speeches in churches by saying, every single time. And I heard him say it because I was at one of his presentations. He said, the good news is we have enough money in this church tonight, enough money here to put people into homes. And people would say, yes, yes, yes. And he'd say, the trouble is it's all in your bank books, it's in your pockets, and it's in your wallets. I'm not going to turn you upside down and shake you. I keep promising you that. I never will. And I will never shame people for what they are able to give. But I will encourage you to give as a sign of your faith in God. Not necessarily this congregation either. I'm not saying write a check and put it in here. I'm not saying fill out your estimate of giving card and say you're going to give $38,000 a month to this church. If you want to do that, that's cool. We'll say amen to that. Jerry's going, yes. Jerry, our financial secretary, is going, yes, yes, yes. It's about trust, though. It's about getting rid of worry. And if you're still worried, look what Jesus says. He says, go into the world. Look at the fields, look at the flowers, look at the grass. If God is going to clothe that to be more beautiful than Solomon in all of his glory, is he not going to take care of you? And consider the birds of the air who never work. They never, well, they work for their food. They get their worms. But they don't store things for the next day or the next week or the next year. Aren't you more valuable to God than the birds? God's going to provide. 
because we have a God who is a God of abundance. The thing is, what will we do with what God has given us? Now, I said it's not just about money. It really is not about money at all. It's about trusting God. Look at the treasure in that box up there. Now, Jesus is not necessarily going to bobble at you and say, yeah, did get me out of a couple of traffic tickets, but anyway. You have Christ. You have Jesus. You have a Savior. You have the Word of God. You have peace. You have the sacrament of his love for you. You have been given so many things in abundance. That's what I want you to be a steward of. Be a steward of grace. Be a steward of forgiveness. Be a steward of love. That's what's going to change the world. And if those things are your first priority, everything else falls into place. So enough is enough. That's why Jesus said when you pray, pray like this, give us this day our daily bread, our daily bread. And enough is enough when it comes to worrying. Because if you can't stop worrying, you're going to end up with an ulcer and migraines. You're going to end up maybe with health that is not any good anymore because you'll worry yourself to death. People can do that. So say enough is enough to worry. Enough is enough for today. Don't worry, be happy. It's not just a crazy song, it's the way that we live in Jesus Christ, to the glory of God and our Savior. Amen.